Hello, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's talk. We will get started momentarily after we give another minute or so for people to log on to the discussion. We thank you very much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Fairbank Center's Contemporary Chinese Society series. My name is Yawen Lei. I'm an associate professor um, in the Department of Sociology at Harvard University. I'm also a faculty member at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. Today, it's our great honor to have Professor Bin Xu. Dr. Xu is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at Emory University. His research, his research interests include cultural sociology, political sociology, and Chinese studies. He is the author of The Politics of Compassion, The Sichuan Earthquake and the Civic Engagement in China. And this award-winning book was published by Stanford University Press in 2017. It examines the huge wave of volunteering in the wake of the 2008 Sichuan earthquake and how the volunteering is intertwined with the political relation between the state and the civil society. And today he is going to give a talk based on his forthcoming book entitled Chairman Mao's Children, Generation and the Politics of Memory in China, um, and which will be published by Cambridge University Press this year. And I wanna congratulate Professor Xu for the publication of this important book. And just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. We will have the time, have time for Professor Xu to answer questions at the end. And now without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Professor Xu. Welcome Professor Xu. Thank you very much, Yawen. Um, thank you all for coming. So the book is, has already been published. It was published last year, 2021. Um, by Cambridge University Press in hardcover and ebook. Uh, of course, there's a, a ridiculous price tag um, on the hardcover. If you don't want to pay $110, and you can find ebooks, uh, you know, online in your in your libraries. So let me just briefly introduce the background for this book. I assume many of our, our uh, listeners know this uh, program, but so I keep it very brief. So I start with the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why. And who were the teaching, the educated youth generation, which is the you know, main character of this book. And those people were the 17 million secondary school students and graduates who were mostly born in the 1940s and 1950s. So they were equivalent to um, the baby boomer generation in the United States. And what, what is the send down program? So the Sendang program's official name is up to the mountains and down to the villages. Shangshan in Chinese, but in English literature, we usually say it's Sendang program or re, uh, re sustication um, pro program. And where, where would they were sent down to? And they were sent down to villages and uh, farms and quasi-military uh, farms, which is usually called production and the construction core, being twin. And when, and uh, historians have a consensus about um, the formal program of Sandown that is from the early 1960s to the 19, um, late 1970s. So here's a timeline uh, of this program. So before early 1960s, there is small scale migration programs on the voluntary basis for people to vo voluntarily go down to the countryside and to become peasants. Um, some of the model Zhijing were from that period in the 1950s, for example, Ho Jing and the Xing Yans, and later were used as model to mobilize people to go down to the countryside in the 1960s and during the Cultural Revolution. So sometimes people have the mis misconception that the Sendang program actually started in the 1950s, but the formal program of Sendang actually started in the 1960s. Um, so the first wave of this program was uh, from 1962 to 1966 before the Cultural Revolution. And most prominent group of this Sendang Zhiqing were those um, Shanghai Zhiqing who went down to the 
uh, Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. The second wave, also the biggest wave, um, also the, the most known one is from 1968 to 1970. You can actually see here Liu Xiaobeng's book. Um, there's a chart about the number of the people who went down to the countryside. So you can see the big wave of the second one. And the third wave is from in, in, the, in the 1970s, and it ended in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And why would the, the Chinese government uh, decided to send so many people down to the countryside. There's a debate among historians about, you know, what's the purpose. I don't think the debate is particularly productive because many reasons could be um, existing at the same time. For example, one of the biggest reasons is that um, the Chinese government used the send down to solve the urban unemployment problem. Because this is a, a baby boomer generation, there's a huge increase of the uh, youth in the in the uh, urban centers, but the command economy at the time cannot absorb so many people at the same time. And then this is one of the ways to solve this problem. And also there's an ideological goal that is um, at the time, top leaders of China believed that, um, you know, some people uh, in some youth um, born in this generation uh, were born under the red flag, so-called. Um, and then, but they were contaminated by those bourgeoisie uh, in the um, education system. So they need to be re-educated um, uh, by those revolutionary poor and the lower peasants. So this is, you can see the poster here, the vast universe is out there in the rural area and the, the educated youth can make a huge difference uh, in the countryside. So that was the mobilizing uh, slogan for this uh, huge mobiliz mobilization uh, program. And also another goal is to develop some of the rural areas, particularly the frontiers uh, in uh, some of the uh, provinces and, and also um, ethnic regions. So, but the programs later uh, were, were believed to be a fa failure. And in the 19, late 1970s, almost everyone knew that the program didn't go well. And it caused a lot of social, economic, and human costs on various groups involved in this program. For example, peasants are not happy about that because there was, in most of the rural villages, there was no shortage of labor. And then you have a huge group of people who come down uh, from you know, um, urban centers who are young and hungry and didn't do um, food work well. And this is actually exacerbated the food shortage problem. And also the parents and parents of the youth were certainly not very satisfied because a long time separation from those teenager um, people. And also um, the, um, the children themselves were not satisfied because they didn't see their future and they, their education was delayed and so on and so forth. So it caused a huge cost on pretty much everyone and also the government paid a lot of money for this program. So in the end of the late uh, 1970s and early 1980s and particularly 1970s, there were several uh, large scale protests, particularly in Yunnan and Xinjiang um, in which the Zhiqing petitioned to the uh, government to uh, demand to go back to urban centers. In responding to the protests, the Chinese government decided to uh, end this program gradually and allow the Zhiqing to go back to their um, uh, hometowns. So Michel Bonin, uh, who was one of the most prominent historians on this topic and called this generation as a lost generation. Of course, you know, this phrase is borrowed from World War I, but um, he used this uh, term to describe um, the feeding of this generation when they returned to cities, no job, no education, didn't know where their future is. So they're lost in their hometowns. So you can see the painting here, which is in stark contrast to the, to the first uh, poster, propaganda, propaganda post that I just to show. And also there's some long-term impacts which are studied by sociologists. For example, lots of delays in life course on pretty much everything such as education, jobs and marriage and childbirth and so on and so forth. And also um, the, when they um, 
already absorbed into the labor force in, in the uh, cities in the 1990s, um, there's another wave of um, uh, difficulties for those people. That is when they become SOE workers, if they were lucky, but in the 1990s, there's a huge SOE reform. Many of them were laid off in this, um, pro in the, in this period, and uh, which was, according to some of our interviewees, were even more difficult than the uh, send down years. And this long-term impact still persists today. Um, if you now are able to go to China in Shanghai, um, every Wednesday morning, you go to um, Jiangxi Zhonglu and also Hankou. There's a labor bureau office, Xinfang uh, Ban, which is letter and visit office there. You see a small crowd of elderly people a partition into the government, they're asking for policy adjustments on many of the issues related to their pensions and health insurance because of the regional differences. Um, all the details, if you're interested, um, you can see in the books and also in my published articles, but for the sake of time, I'll skip them. But anyway, the point is that the long-term impacts are still existing today. But not everyone in this generation is in misery as those people. Some people are so-called winners. For example, the biggest winner we know now is President Xi Jinping, who went down to Shanxi uh, at the time from Beijing and spent seven years there before um, he went to Tsinghua University and as a student. And so there was a book I recommend everyone if you're interested in this topic and you can read it's a Chinese book published by the Chonggong Chongyang Dang Xiao Chu Ban She, which is a narrative about his experience um, in the uh, countryside. So in the book, um, the narrative pattern in the book is an interesting uh, one that is more like upbeat and also upward uh, story. In other words, the tough years in the countryside are um, you know um, depicted as the sort of a, a test and also exercise and the character building uh, experience for this leader. So as you can see in this quote, the tough life of the seven years of going up to the mountains and down to the villages built my character. So the past suffering has been redeemed into today's success. And also as you can see in this narrative, it's not just by himself, but also it's, it's about China, right? China is at the low point, and now uh, because everybody has been uh, working so hard, making a lot of efforts, and becoming a superpower uh, in in the world. So that kind of a personal and world uh, history narratives are weaved into one, and in this um, narrative about this this leader who is the member of the generation. Um, not only Xi Jinping, but also other important leaders of this generation are from the uh, Sanjiang uh, youth. For example, Li Keqiang, Wang Qishan, and pretty much all of them uh, in this age range were Sanjiang youth. But this, youth, this generation also is facing an identity issue because the Sanjiang program is so heavily overlapping with the Cultural Revolution. So they have an identity issue because many of them not all of them, many of them were red guards. And if you ask someone who is not from the generation, what do you think of those people? You probably get an answer that though those people are just a bunch of the red guards. So that kind of perception, if you, if you um, prefer, you can call it some misconception, is something that troubles this generation. They have this identity issue and, and try to stay away from this stigma. And, but at the same time, they ask themselves, uh, are we victims or are we heroes or are we something else? So this is the identity issue is becoming part of what we call the difficult past. So the term difficult past is not just a random loosely used uh, term. It comes from one of the classic essays in collective memory research by uh, Wagner Pacifici and Schwartz the essay itself is by Vietnam War. So in the essay, both authors talked about Vietnam War and the sentence I quote here, the event which refers to the Vietnam War is swallowed by, as it were, but never assimilated. Of course, I believe, you know, this sentence can be applied to 
um, the Sendang program as well. It's, it's there, it's difficult. Um, it's very tough for this generation to come to terms with. More specifically, I think there are three kinds of problems um, uh, uh, pertaining to their difficult past. One is the political problem. How to politically evaluate this program? Is it a failure or is it just success or just something else? And also how to evaluate the events related to this Sendam program for example, the Cultural Revolution. And there's also social problem, as I already mentioned, that long-term impacts on this generation are basically all this are our social problems. Um, and the government and also the generation need to solve those social problems. And the, the last one is the cultural problem. In other words, how to commemorate the past, how to commemorate this difficult past. This is the focus of the book. Um, in other words, the book is not a historical study of the Sendang generation, what happened in the past and, and so on. It is a social study of collective memory of the Chuxin generation. So I spent quite a lot of years on, on this book. Uh, so for example, um, in, and I also I have different layers of um, memories you know, included in the book. Uh, in chapters one and two, I talked about individual memory in life stories. Here, the picture I'm interviewing people and went to people's homes and, and, and so on to talk about their past. And also I uh, look at literary works, but the purpose is not to do a literary study, but to examine how people remember the past through literary works. In other words, how people remember the past through writing literary books and reading literary books and discussing literary books. So it's literary memory instead of literary works. In chapter four, I talked about so-called the sites of memory, um, including exhibits and museums. Um, for example, these two pictures are the museums in Heilongjiang, the other one is in Shanghai. And of course, this is a very typical memory um, topic. So I uh, examine the very complex cultural and the political processes revolving around these two uh, museums and other museums and exhibits as well. Um, so uh, over the years, I also participated in a lot of uh, um, you know, uh, uh, commemorative activities. Um, many of the people in this generation organized many, many commemorative activities, ranging from dinner parties um, to performance, as you can see here, and to some revisiting trips to their send down places. Uh, sometimes you, you feel that this is just basically expression of a nostalgia, but the things are more complicated than, than nostalgia, or uh, I can say that nostalgia is a sociological uh, social uh, phenomenon that actually needs uh, lots of uh, sociological insights um, to look into the uh, complex processes. So it's also political, it's very economic, and money plays an important role in all these um, commemorative activities. That's in chapters five and six. So I, I want to achieve three goals uh, in this book. The first one is to understand how Zhijing generation comes to terms with the difficult personal and the collective past, what can explain the variations and, uh, of their memory. And I, more generally, I want to speak to the literature, uh, which is already established as a subfield that is the Mao legacies in the post Mao era. I believe some of the uh, faculty members or graduate students at Harvard are interested in this topic as well. And, but the second goal of the book is more theoretical. I want to advance the theory of memory and the generation. And memory and generation is an important topic, of course. We were born into uh, different points of, uh, different time points of history. And um, our growing up experience always um, is with some historical events. And how do we look at our personal past is a way to think about how actually and think about history and other big issues. So memory and the generation is um, a way to understand another very essential topic in sociology that is the intersection between personal biography and the history, uh, which is what C.R.I. Muses calls um, um, sociological imagination. In other words, the ability to understand the larger historical scene in terms of its meaning for the inner life and external career of a variety of individuals. Now, this 
text actually shows up in pretty much every introduction uh, textbooks, but it, you know, people rarely do something that directly talked about those issues in, in terms of memory. The third goal is to um, talk about some of the issues related to um, the uh, Zhijing generation and also the Mao years, for example, social inequality and also historical responsibility. So these are the three goals of the book. Today's talk for the sake of time, I only focus on individual memory and life stories, in other words, chapters one and two. If I have time, I probably will briefly talk about other chapters related to in individual memory. So over the years, I sat down with uh, um, many, many uh, individuals from this generation and listening to their life stories. So sometimes they cried and sometimes they, very, they are very excited. So it's very um, valuable learning experience for me to learn about their past, how they perceive the past. So gradually I found that in the life stories I um, listened to, uh, in every life story I listened to, there are two components. One is their view of the personal experience. And the second is their historical evaluation of the event they experienced. In other words, when they remember their past in the Zhiqing years, they talk about themselves and also they talk about the event, they have evaluative views of both. So this, these two components actually correspond to what I just mentioned in Muse's sociological imagination, that is the intersection between personal biography and history. So um, for each component, people have their opinions and either it's positive or negative. So if we put the, the two dimensions together, you have a variety of narrative patterns. For example, I listed here, some patterns are pretty straightforward and self-evident. For example, this person, if this person believes that his life actually benefits from the send down years, it's more positive. And also he has, you know, uh, positive views about historical evaluation. But if the person believes that his time in the um, uh, years, for, for seven years were wasted and with no education and, and it ruined his or her time, life, and that was basically a negative view about, you know, um, personal experience, and this person we will have very negative historical evaluation. So these are pretty commonsensical, but some other narrative patterns are not so much. For example, the person could have say like, you know, the Sendong years have this light, uh, character building function, but at the same time, the person believes that this is, a, this is not the life we chose. We were forced to go down to the countryside and the whole event was wrong. So this narrative pattern, and if you can see here, is the one which as the top corner uh, on the right, that is the success despite suffering, or what didn't destroy me uh, makes me stronger, that kind of suffering um, uh, narrative. So I have all these um, narrative patterns and also vivid life stories, uh, which are recorded in my books. And if you're interested, you can read every life story. But I could have stopped here, but you know, um, I tried to ask myself, what can explain this variation of the narrative pattern? What are the factors that are the explaining, most important explaining factors? So um, I found in my research that there's one factor that stood out in my um, theorizing process that is class. And I divide the class into two components. One is class in the present. In other words, the person's class position in post mall era, particularly today, and class in the past, which is the class position in the Mao years, in their uh, you know, uh, growing up years. So past, class in the present is more like a normal class con uh, concept that includes several types of capital, which some of the sociologists in the audience might be very familiar with, that is economic capital, cultural capital, social capital. So the class position in the present is linked to personal experience. In other words, when they are talking about or evaluating their personal experience, they, want, they actually uh, evaluate the experience through their class positions. So the correlation is very strong and between the present 
uh, class position and a memory of the personal experience. For example, those people who have higher class positions today tend to tell redemptive stories. In other words, suffering to success, hardship built uh, characters because they already so-called made it, right? But the people who at the lower level of class positions tend to tell sliding down stories, total ways to go down to the uh, to, to go down to the to the um, countryside and and so on and so forth. So in this um, theorizing um, process, I feel like Bourdieu's idea, Pierre Bourdieu, French sociologist, uh, for sociologist and uh, theory of class, it makes a lot of sense. In Bourdieu's theory, um, it was the aesthetic taste that is this cultural signal or the constitu constitutive part of a class that expresses and justifies uh, class position. Memory functions like aesthetic taste here, memory justifies and expresses class position. In other words, when they are talking about their personal past, they are actually talking about their present, the present class position. So you have winner stories and the loser stories and totally different stories, and when, as you can see. So, so far, so good. But I later found that the other component, historical evaluation of the events in the now years cannot be explained by the class in the present. It's simply just no correlation at all. You have high class people who actually are very negative about you know, cultural revolution and the send down program. And then you have lower class people who have, have a huge variation of explanation as well. So I was thinking about is class just one of the factor can only explain part of their memory or is a class that can be a effective uh, factor that explains both components. And later I found that, well, this, um, this generation of so-called Chairman Mao's children, they grew up in a period when class was very essential, was very important, but that class was different. That, that class was a political class, mostly based on their chushen or chenfen, two interchangeably used concepts. Of course, their nuances, they're not really identical, but I use chushen here just for, um, to, to simplify the everything. So class is very central to their coming of age experience. For example, if you are born into a bad, bad, bad class on chushen, you probably would not uh, get some of the critical opportunities to move upward in class mobility. And so the, on this topic, actually Bourdieu makes, uh, Bourdieu's class theory makes sense again, because Bourdieu's class concept is a multi-capital uh, concept. In one of his capitals, for example, the social capital, um, there's a subcategory of class that is uh, a subcategory of capital that is political capital. In other words, political capital is a subtype of social capital. So his concept can cover both Mao and post Mao class systems. In other words, it's just the different configuration and also different weights that the different capital carry um, in the Mao and post Mao era. Another thing is that Bourdieu's concept of class is not really a structural determinism, that he uses another concept that is habitus. So for those of you who are not sociologists, habitus mainly means that disposition to act and think in some ways. And that habitus is formed and structured and also shaped by the class position you were born into and you grew up within. So there's a like theoretical tongue twister uh, habitus, of structuring structure, 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 which means that it is structured by the uh, class position and also is structuring your um, ac action and also um, uh, schema of perception. So habitus concept, concept nicely theorizes what we usually call the imprint of the Mao years or the class politics on this generation of the people, um, particularly on their coming of age experience. Uh, in other words, they form this habitus in their coming of age years. And in particular, in, and also this habitus concept is not structural, entirely structural. It forms in a person's interaction with the structure. So there's agency there. It depends on how you interact 
with the structure. And also Bourdieu talks a little bit about habitus change, but not much, but he leaves room for habitus change. So I put all these together. We have this table, which is at the heart of the uh, chapters and chapters one and two. So in this table, the columns are the political capital that a person has from good chosen to middle and bad chosen, right? And the uh, rows are the, uh, are the, this person's political performance types. For example, this person, if a person has a good chosen and also um, actively participating in political performance, this person is the faithful red. But some people who have good chosen, um, but are totally indifferent to politics, not interested at all. And those people will tell you that, you know, in my growing up experience, I don't care about politics, politics at all. Um, but um, if you look at it on the other side of the experience, their experience and their narrative, you find that being not interested in politics is a privilege because they had good choosing. So they were protected by their good choosing from political persecution and other troubles, right? So they become indifferent red. So something that is similar to what we conventionally understood as the economic capital in class um, for example, if a kid from a wealthy family said that I don't care about money at all, I only care about arts and other things, that is because you have enough money, you don't have to worry about money at all. So it's the same rationale here. But for the people who were born into middle to bad children, um, it's almost impossible to be indifferent to politics because politics is everything in that period. Some of them try to um, participated in political performance very actively. Those people are aspirants. In other words, they try to outperform their good chosen people by proving that I'm also a revolutionary, more revolutionary than you are, not just by birth, you know, also by performance. But other people, I want to say many of them from middle to bad chosen family, and they will say like, I'm going to stay away from politics and stay away from um, trouble, uh, don't get into trouble because of my bad chosen. So these people are with yours. So I found that these habitus types actually nicely correspond to their historical evaluation. So here's one um, example that is the winner's stories. In other words, those people who have higher uh, social economic status today, and all of them have pretty uh, positive views about personal experience. Uh, some say, you know, the send, uh, send down years is certainly a very tough, but I got a lot of benefits from that, building characters and so on and so forth. But their historical evaluation varies and also varies across their habitus uh, type. The faithful red has positive historical evaluation. The indifferent red, because they're indifferent, they have neutral to unconcerned, that kind of attitude toward a historical evaluation. And the aspirants, if their habitus was not changing later and they still remain positive uh, about the historical um, events and pretty much the same as faithful red. And the withdrawers are the people who are actually very negative about um, historical evaluation. For example, I have one example here. Um, Mr. Yuan, who is a university professor in Shanghai, and he was born into a family whose father was uh, um, uh, a, an editor of a newspaper in the KMT period. And as you can imagine, that was a very bad tuition. So he was sent down to a um, farm in Chongming Island in Shanghai. And he found out most of the um, Zhiqing in that farm were basically the same uh, category that's, you know, in the black or not so good um, category. So he had pretty successful career, of course, and he talked about, you know, the benefits of the tough years um, for his later success, but he said that this Sendam program is de definitely a waste. If someone still says the program was good, okay, and an easy way to test it is that you send your children to the countryside. And so that's basically the idea, the narrative pattern that we can say success despite suffering. What didn't destroy me made me stronger, that kind of a uh, story. But you probably would ask, did the people's habitus change, particularly given the sea changes in Chinese society since the Mao years? The answer is yes. 
So habitus change usually happened at the moments of awakening, self-analysis, and disillusionment. And all these habitus change actually going toward the direction of a negative evaluation of the program. And among the habitus types, aspirants are more likely to change if we can go back to, he, to the table here. So the aspirants um, performance um, has some opportunistic elements because they mostly rely on the rewards they got from the system. If I perform very well, a student get rewards from the system, didn't get into college and didn't get opportunities um, to be recruited as workers in the factory, all these kind of important um, opportunities. And I got a disillusion and just started to um, question whether the system is fair or is the system just, you know, and, you know, this is just a um, uh, problematic. And also what is interesting about habitus change is that for this generation, their habitus change happened at several very important historical moments. So this is where we can see the intersection between personal biography and also history. For example, after the Ling Biao's death, that's one big moment for many people in this generation because Ling Biao, before his incident, um, was the semi-god figure. Now, Ling Biao was a traitor. And so does that mean, you know, the Ling, what Ling Biao said before was basically a lie and how many lies uh, told to us and things like that. And another moment is in the end of the Cultural Revolution, particularly after the first Tiananmen movement and also the thought liberation movement in the late 1970s and also later, a, little, a few years later, the so-called culture fever, Wen Hua Re, in the 1980s. I have one interviewee uh, who, whose habitus was pretty stubborn, uh, aspirant habitus was pretty stubborn and he didn't experience awakening moment even after the Cultural Revolution, not until in the 1980s. Um, he actually was sent by his Dan Wei to two colleges um, to, uh, to become so-called Jingzhou Jiaoshi training teachers where he listened to a lot of lectures. At the time, you know, Chinese colleges was experiencing a you know, very dramatic moment. Um, students are reading social scientific books and philosophical books uh, translated from Western languages. And, uh, you know, poets become rock stars uh, and so on and so forth. So that was a cultural fever um, period. And he started to think about his life and also all these things. And they suddenly realized that he was actually cheated by the system and he used to blame he himself and also his family for all his troubles, why I had a bad children. This is more like a sin. And at the time when he in those colleges and he got, uh, he, he was aware that the problem is with the system instead of himself or his family. So this is just one of the many uh, habitus change stories. And uh, again, aspirants are the, are the people who are more likely to change their habitus. Um, and also just very briefly, um, those with uh, lower class positions also can be explained by, their memories can be explained by the, the habitus but one of the uh, most interesting uh, categories is the faithful red and those people who actually experience the downward mobility from workers, families, usually workers, families in the Mao years, and then to workers, family in the post Mao years, but got laid off or had any uh, had, had lots of other uh, troubles because of their uh, drinking years. So their personal experience was um, very negative, but what about their historical evaluation? The dilemma for them is that they believe they were the loyal people. They were the people who were passionate about the ideology in the Mao years, but how come they ended up being in such a miserable place? So you would imagine those people probably have some many, many grievances about um, the Mao years, but actually it's not. Many of them were so-called grassroots Maoists. In other words, in their view, about the Mao era and their blame were put on the present government instead of Mao, uh, Mao government. So basically the narrative goes like this. In the Mao years, workers you know, enjoyed a very uh, high position, 
uh, one of my interviewees I uh, quoted here, and his father got hospitalized and his Dunway paid for the medical bill and Dunway's leader visited the hospital and to see him. Um, but, you know, this person had trouble paying his own medical bills after, after the Cultural Revolution. And also he had a trouble because he went to Xinjiang and all kinds of trouble as well. So he's blaming the current uh, government because he believed that the current government is corrupted. And also there's a huge alliance between big capitalists and the government officials and so on and so forth. So this is more like a nostalgia a story people are telling um, to um, solve this um, dilemma between the past and, and the present. Um, so I put all these stories together and code the stories um, by uh, quantifying some of the key elements. So you have this regression tables. Um, you know, I'm a sociologist. Sociologists always like, uh, you know, more like astrologers to now looking for stars. If there's one star you got really interested in and you got um, significance, right? If two stars is huge significance and then you got extremely uh, excited. So you have all these uh, stars here, but you know, this just to confirm some of the findings from qualitative research and um, it's more like, um, you know, it's, it's the test the theory which certainly passed the test, which is very important, very interesting. If you're interested in those technical details, you can read the book and the particular appendix part. Boring details are always in appendix, right? So anyway, so the big picture is that the intergenerational differences in individuals' memory are very important to understand um, generational memory. So let me just use a metaphor um, to talk about the generational memory. So in Chinese, there's a uh, expression that is called 时代大潮, which means you know our times is more like a tidal wave, a huge tidal wave. And the people who were born at a certain time in this generation were the people who were involved in this tidal wave. Some people were able to ride in the wave, other people were tossed by the wave to the beach, and also other people were drawn into the wave. So when they were, when the tidal wave has already passed and they actually in the different locations, when they look at the past, they are, they're looking at the tidal wave, looking at their past from their different locations. So this is a metaphor I use to talk about generations. In other words, generation is not a homogenous entity. It is an entity with various kinds of people, but they experience the same event and then they have different views about the event. And I try to explain their memories by looking at their class positions. And in other words, I look at the uh, uh, class position in the present and in the past. And I also use um, Bourdieu's concept of habitus. Uh, in this case, it's more political hot habitus. And also habitus can change as a response to dramatic social transformation in China. Uh, from Mao period and the two reform period. So you have the synchronization, or sometimes it's not synchronization, it's a mismatch between personal views and also the, um, the, um, the, the historical changes. So I use Chairman Mao's children in the title uh, deliberately because I believe, you know, this is also a metaphorical understanding of this generation. Children were born into a family, siblings, right? Born into the same family. They share the same parents and they have the imprints from their parents, but they grew up very differently and they have a different life paths. Um, so they have this uh, variation in their memory of their family. And in this case, um, they were all Chairman Mao's children. They were born into a period. There's very strong political socialization. They carry the imprints throughout their life, but they, they walk their life paths in a very different way and also have very different um, uh, views of, the, of their memory. So I skipped the, um, the other parts of the um, book. If you're interested, uh, you can actually look at. So overall, I'm just wrapping up. Uh, one is the book's goal is empirical. Uh, I tried to provide a fine-grained multi-level analysis of this generation who are caught between past and present, and also use multiple methods from interviews uh, to um, uh, participant observations, and also literary works, textual analysis, museums and memorials, and so on and so forth to tell a story of this generation. 
And I also try to make some theoretical contributions to the literature. I point out intergenerational differences in memory are also very important. And the class which is ignored in this literature of collective memory is one of the major explanation factors. Of course, there are other factors in the book as well, such as group and also uh, production of culture, uh, cultural products and museum and so on and so forth. Um, and also the normative goal is I provide some thoughts about some political ethical problems related to those um, seemingly apolitical narratives such as, you know, suffering into uh, success and a point out, you know, class is something you cannot avoid. The winners tell their stories, but sometimes the winners of this generation tend to ignore this continuing suffering um, of the people who still suffer from this long-term, the, the long-term impacts of this generation. I'll stop there and also welcome um, thoughts and comments and questions. Oh, thank you so much, Bean, for the great talk. Um, now we will go ahead and take some time for questions. So just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions in the question box in your control panel. And now we have, um, I saw three questions. So the first question is about um, like a similar um, initiative today. Um, so uh, Zhong Yi um, asked, uh, what can the story of Jiqing tell us about uh, contemporary state initiatives to send university students and graduates to volunteer in the countryside? Uh, for example, uh, and do you think these 21st century programs are likely to produce similar social cultural consequences? And since you have also studied youth volunteers and civic engagement in contemporary China, I wonder if you think the state-led youth mobilization programs from these two different eras are an appropriate comparison to make. Uh, thanks for the question. And also thanks for um, mentioning my previous work on the Sichuan earthquake volunteering. I think this comparison makes sense um, on some points, for example, um, it's um, the, the students and also youth were mobilized to build, um, to, to contribute to the, the construction in the frontiers, um, particularly in Cebu. Um, but I also want to point out several things that are um, very important for us um, to, when, when we're making this um, uh, comparison. One is that most of the and uh, Zhiqing program at the time were forcible migration. So I wanna say that a state-led forcible migration is one of the accurate definitions of a Zhiqing, uh, the Sandown program, with some exceptions. For example, um, before the Cultural Revolution is voluntary and then after the Cultural Revolution, particularly in the second wave from 1968 to 1970, in Shanghai is called which means all red, that everyone should go down with some exceptions. Uh, for example, if you're sick or you have, you're disabled or uh, other exceptions, but most of the people have to go down to the countryside. So this is a one key difference. Uh, today's mobilization programs rarely are forcible. Uh, nobody would um, be uh, forced to uh, go down to the countryside. But I guess, um, and also another way is that, um, you know, the uh, send down program was uh, used as a way to solve the unemployment problem, while the, um, the Xibu Jihua, the volunteering, probably is not a major solution. But there's a linkage in terms of some of the rhetorics and the narratives that the state used to mobilize people, for example, contribute to the construction and also the uh, contribution to the nation, nation's um, big programs and also weave your own youth into uh, all these state-led programs is a way to realize your values and things like that, which is something that the state is interested in. This is why in the post mao era, the Chinese state did not actually suppress the memory of the Sandan program, even if it is a failure. And they want to utilize some of the ideological elements from the program, such as you know, patriotism, contributing your youth to the frontiers, and you use that for ideological purpose. But at the same time, the state didn't want you to, to talk about the event itself. 
So in other parts of my book, I talked about when the memory becomes public memory, it converged into a pattern that is called talking about people, but not talking about the event, highlighting people's contribution, their characters, and but not really talking about the event itself, whether it's a failure or something like that. Don't debate it over it and just, just talking about the people. So this is the linkage I see. Yeah, so and B, there is a related question. So, um, sure. so there is a, um, a, a attendee who asked overall, how would you say uh, the younger generation views the Jiting today and what are the views um, shaped by? I ask the same question. <laughs> I ask my <laughs> interviewees, almost every interviewees, the same question. Um, are your children interested in your past? So guess what? Almost all of them said that, no, they're not interested at all. They don't want to listen to our stories. Um, they believe that this is just a, some, one of the interviewees said that, you know, my, my, my daughter said that this is just a story from Jie which is before 1949. So that was the one way to think about, you know, um, uh, how the generational transmission of memory. Another way to think about all these uh, lack of interest in uh, their parents' past is to um, understand this generation's dilemma. In other words, they are facing the reality that their cultural influence in the public sphere is going down very quickly. Nobody cares about their memory. Nobody cares about their past. When they keep talking about their suffering in the countryside, eating a lot of bitterness, but younger generations just don't care. And the older ones believe that you're just a bunch of red guards. So they have to face this kind of conceptions and understanding all the time, try to prove that we are the worthy people, we are the people who deserve respect. So this is why their voices are really loud and to let everyone know that our life experience is something that you need to respect and we can tell good stories and stuff like that. So this is also why they organize so many activities. Um, they're so active in promoting their memory because of this you know, amnesia, or if you want to say like a lack of interest um, in, their, in their past. Yeah, and um, so I just want to remind the audience that when you type your question, just make sure that you explain what do you mean in the question, because sometimes really a short sentence, I mean, uh, the, the speaker cannot really understand a short sentence. Um, so it will be very important for you to really explain to us your question so that I can actually read a question to our speaker. And there are two questions about the countryside. So the first question is, did the experience reinforce or challenge the anti-rural and anti-peasant views of the urban youth? And did you do your research mainly in cities in China? Very good questions. Um, these questions are talked about in the book. So let's think about this issue in this way. So most of the memories are the Zhiqing's memories, right? They were the urban youth and went down to the countryside and they certainly suffered a lot. And then they came back to cities. And eventually most of them came back to cities, right? And then they talked about their past suffering. But from another point of view, let's say from a peasant point of view, you're just, you know, 17 million hungry young people coming down from urban centers and try to competing uh, to compete with us uh, for the food and grab our food, st stealing our chicken and sleeping with our and daughters and so on and so forth, you are not suffering. The people who actually are suffering are us peasants who lived this kind of love for thousands of years. And what's the, what's the point of talking about suffering there? So I guess there's one big issue in, um, in the memory of the Zhiqing generation, which I talked about in the, particularly in the last chapter and also the literature chapter as well is the class and a class bias and a class, a class blindness. Um, uh, most of the Zhiqing really don't care about how peasants remember them and how peasants also suffer at the time. And the peasants also are victims of this wrong policy as well and how much uh, difficulties they cause to the uh, local uh, community as well. So in the 1990s, there was a literary debate between some writers like Zhang Kang Kang 
and also other Zhiqing writers as well. So Zhang Kangkang and other people raised the point that, you know, the Zhiqing memory is very self-centered. Um, and also Zhiqing did not really do uh, serious self-reflections of what they did during the Cultural Revolution, not only to the peasants' community in the, in the rural areas, but also to their teachers and to the people they struggled, so-called struggled in the Cultural Revolution. So it's, it's a memory lack of self-reflection. And Zhang Kang Kang was, uh, was a kind of maverick in the literary memory because he, she was on, probably the only one who actually did this kind of uh, uh, reflection. And, uh, um, and then he was um, hated by most of the Zhiqing, uh, according to my interviewees, um, particularly those people who went to Heilongjiang because Zhang Kangkang went to Heilongjiang uh, as well. So yeah, to answer your question, it's main, the city urban divide is another way to talk about class divide. This is why class is so essential. And it's not only essential because it shaped people's memory, but also essential. It actually created some blindness in their memory. And uh, so in the last chapter of a book, I went a little bit normative um, to sort of criticize this kind of a self-centered memory. And also the second question, yeah, because most of the Zhiqing, uh, you know, returned to cities. I did uh, my research in, in cities. But I uh, participated in quite a lot of uh, um, revisiting trips uh, to the Asian places as well. And there is a, a methodological question. So um, Robert Walker asks, is there a methodological challenge in that all your material is based on memory and all memory is contemporaneous and you compare the past and the present, yet both memories are shaped by the present and only class may be considered objective, but even that is described from the perspective of the present. Good, that's a good question. Yeah, exactly. That's why my focus is on, you know, contemporaneous memory. In other words, the purpose is not to examine the past to tell you what really happened in the past, but to, think about how they think about past. Um, in other words, um, the focus is on memory. The, how the present positions shape their memory is exactly my focus. And as for class, it's, as you said, that is the objective category, which can be uh, relatively easier to identify. Um, so I guess this is one of the distinctive feature of collective memory research. We are interested in not only the past, but also the past in the present. Uh, in other words, we are looking more at the present instead of just the sheer um, history of the past. Yeah, and the la there is a last question. There is an audience who um, is interested in um, the relevance of your research to um, US today. Sure. So he thinks uh, the US is undergoing some kind of cultural revolution. <laughs> so he wonder um, whether, I mean, the implication of a, your study um, on how we understand the American society today in terms of cancel culture. That's a big question. Uh, first, I'm not sure uh, what you mean by U.S. is experiencing a cultural revolution today. <laughs> and second, what I can see, the relevance of my study is actually on some part of the book, but it's not really the part of today's uh, presentation, but I briefly mentioned that is the pattern, people, but not event. In other words, that uh, in some of the memories even in the United States and other places, people try to highlight themselves instead of talking about the event. So for example, Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And if you have been there, you know that, you know, it's all the names on the two marble walls um, and then nothing about the event it, at all. Why? Because the event itself is so controversial. So highlight the people without talking about event is one of the ways to avoid those uh, issues and but at the same time providing um, a way for for people to interact and talk with each other about the past. So this is one of the things that we can uh, talk about whether this people but not event um, is justified or 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 the um, and also since Emory is in the American South that uh, you know in Civil War memory um, there's also a people but not event. Um, 
uh, narrative pattern, for example, highlighting some people, Rob the Ely, and highlighting their gentlemanship and stuff like that, but not talking about what the event is actually is. So that's one of the ways. Again, the people and the not event is a way that the people invented to solve the memory dilemma problems in various contexts, including the United States. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Xu, for the great and insightful talk. We run out of time and we still cannot answer all of the remaining questions. And um, thank you everyone, we appreciate you being here. And our next lecture will be on April 14th. Uh, Professor Rachel Stern from UC Berkeley will give a talk entitled Performing Legality. Um, and we hope to see you next time. And um, so I want to emphasize that um, at Harvard and also at the Fairbank Center, we don't censor any speech. And, um, but I want to make sure that uh, our speaker understand the question so that that's sometimes, so I will, for example, this a person who asked question about like cultural revolution in the US because I don't really understand that sentence. So I asked the audience to actually to clarify the question so that I can read a question to Professor Xu. And I just want to emphasize, we appreciate, we uh, actually value a lot of, we value a lot of academic freedom and that's our responsibility. Um, and thank you everyone. And we hope to see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much.